and our guest Ben Coral. The walkers are coming, Coral. I just had to throw that in at some walkers, point. Coral. <laughs> coral. 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 Hello, my friends. Thank you for joining us for the PebCAG podcast, a weekly information security show featuring some all around good people. It is week 14 of 2023. I'm Chris Louie, and traveling this week, so my audio will sound different. With me, I have the chicken god, Brian Deach. That's a, a lot to unpack. I will say a little quick update on the Bronco. I ripped a fart so bad, I think I may have voided the warranty on that vehicle. So <laughs> it was it was rough, gassed everyone out. Thanks, Shay. Did you turn on the heater and, and lock the windows? Well, actually, right now, the top's not even on, so uh, it's still lingered, though. Yeah. And we don't have handless Glenn Medina this week, but he should be joining us later in the show, so he doesn't get a nice intro like Brian did. We do have a guest this week, the first guest of 2023. We are honored to have Ben Coral with us. I went on Ben's LinkedIn, and here are all of his current positions. Advisory board member, member board of directors, member senior counsel, and last but not least, CISO for the Americas. With that said, Ben, would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. <laughs> Happy to jump in, do a quick overview or a quick introduction. Uh, first off, I'll say, you know, I'm a husband, father to a couple of college students and one middle schooler. So it keeps me busy. And then during the day, I like to dabble in all things related to cybersecurity. I've spent a couple of decades in the information security industry. And as you just said, I currently have the honor of serving as a field CISO at Zscaler, where I can work with our customers to help them get the best use of the products that they already have, helping them configure those solutions to better protect their organizations. And then I also like giving back as well. And, you know, giving back, I've got a few favorite, you know, charities that I work with, just a way to help people who are less fortunate and may not have had the same opportunities that I've been afforded. So it's not all about me. I really do enjoy helping others and it just helps me to keep the right mindset or perspective in life. Dang, you're already a, a better person than me. So what's your <laughs> what's your favorite charity that you work with? Uh, favorite one that I work with is Join the Journey. And Join the Journey is an organization that gives microloans or small loans to the unbanked. And we'll pick a country. Uh, currently, we're serving in Zambia. Uh, previously, it was Haiti. And it's how do we help people to start a business? So it, it helps that person, it helps their family, and it really builds up their community. Sounds like an auto, to uh, auto title loan company that you're working for. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Like it, like it, yes. Have, have you ever traveled to Zimbabwe? Is that, is that what you said? Zambia. Zambia, Zambia, yeah. Zambia sir. Uh, I have not yet. Uh, give me another year and, and perhaps I will. Right on. That's doing doing some good work there, and I think you'll fit right into this podcast. Number one, you're very passionate about cybersecurity, and number two, you sound like an all around good guy. So that's that's what we like to, to pitch ourselves as. So very happy to have you on, Ben. So happy to be here. Combined, we have decades of information security experience, and are here not just to educate but to entertain. We've got four awesome stories for you this week. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Just a reminder to check out our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at PebCAC podcast. This week, we're going to open with a what were they thinking story. Then we find out who's smarter, humans or AI. For our third topic, we discuss a weak biometric authentication method and close with subscription talk. For our first topic, we're opening with a what were they thinking story. A blog came out in No Before, highlighting the power and the dangers of ChatGPT. Now, I've often used ChatGPT for work use, but I always keep the prompt generic, like, write me an email to my CEO asking for more shares in the company, or 
draft an email apologizing to a customer for falling short in a proof of concept. Even when I keep the prompts generic, I almost always get the desired outcome. Well, the blog outlines something that I've been hearing more and more from my customers. Can we use DLP, so data loss prevention technology, to block employees from entering in proprietary data into ChatGPT? So here's a direct quote from the blog. In one case, an executive cut and pasted the firm's 2023 strategy document into ChatGPT and asked it to create a PowerPoint deck. In another case, a doctor input his patient's name and their medical condition and asked ChatGPT to craft a letter to the patient's insurance company. Wow, I mean, really, the rules of corporate government governance in HIPAA do not stop just because you're chatting with an AI bot. Remember that ChatGPT's parent company, OpenAI, is now 49% owned by Microsoft. I'm sure the terms of use also say something like, anything you enter into ChatGPT becomes property of OpenAI, similar to how all samples submitted to VirusTotal become the property of VirusTotal and their parent company, Google, and can be examined by any paying subscriber. So... The thing that scares me the most about this article isn't really the DLP. It's the fact that Microsoft owns 49% of, of chat or uh, open AI sorry, yeah, of yeah. chat GPT or yeah, open AI, which is wild. So I guess if you can't beat it, buy it. Right. And to own 49%, like they're just playing, they're, they're playing chess, right? There's a, 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 at some point in time, they will own that company. You, there's no one person at open a, or at, yeah, at uh, open API or what is it? Open AI? Open AI. Yeah. Yeah. Sam Altman. Just, just, yeah. 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 He doesn't own 51%, right? No, it's, there's some VCs backing him and I know he owns a, a good amount of it, but there's other VCs there. And I, I'm guessing that they didn't want to allow Microsoft to take 51%. So they bought as much as they possibly could. You think they would have done like 20% or 30? That's just, that's too close. Like that's just going to be a Microsoft company. Well, that's the thing. I mean, Microsoft's only got to get one of those VC just one of those uh, other investors on their side and they have a majority and now they can vote the way they want. So it, it's just a matter of time. And that's, yeah. that's the big bet. The, the only way they can compete with Google and this is the only viable option to unseat Google. How many people do you think at Microsoft when they just released their version of uh chat gpt i forget what the name is it's, it's basically clippy right you yeah. think of those guys were just like pissed or like man all this work now they're gonna own open api or a open ai i keep saying api for some reason boys um the other thing when you're talking about like this doctor and the dlp stuff i uh we have a friend and he he sits on the board of directors for this hospital and he's like ah he's like we do security we should talk about it. i'm like okay he sends over a zoom invite from his iCloud email. <laughs> I'm like, what? I'm like, he's like, yeah, our email sucks. So it's just, it's just easier just to use our own, own personal devices and our own email to, to get stuff done. I was like, how often do you send like, you know, like medical records and stuff like that to your home? He's like, oh yeah, all the time. Like just, it's easier uh -oh. imaging, you name it. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that makes my heart hurt. I, I mean, it really does. I mean, to sit here with technology, you know, as a CISO, my role is not to decide what the business does. It's to set guardrails. And, you know, you start talking about some of these things with, uh, you know, chat GPT and it's like, okay, do we start with awareness training and really sit here saying, this is what is acceptable behavior. And then you sit in your case, Brian, what's unacceptable Use, utilizing your own emails to send patient data. Uh, yeah, where does logic come in? And I get it. People are going to take the shortest path. So at some point, we've got to say what is and what is not acceptable behavior here. Oh, again, yeah. just makes my head and my heart hurt when I hear so, some of these examples. So I always joke and say a CISO is this like they're like one event away from being unemployed. Do you feel like that's how it was when you were on the customer side? Uh, absolutely. My, my favorite meme is I have printed off and it uh, is CISO, Chief Impending Sacrificial Officer. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> were, yeah, you, my... were you ever 
I'll go ahead, Chris. I was just gonna say it might it might not even be your fault. There, there, there are many examples of just a user clicking a bad link. Maybe you didn't have the tools in place, but yeah, a lot of times it's not your fault. Sometimes you're up against a nation state. You think of of Lockheed. Lockheed went against the Chinese PLA, the full force of the Chinese government. Like, how can you defend against you know the the full force of the Chinese government? It's it's like protecting a screen door at some point. Yes. Well, that's why he said sacrificial, right? This is this a matter of time. Um, were you ever promoted to customer, Ben? <laughs> <laughs> were you ever sacrificed? Uh, yeah, there have been many times where you had to have very good documentation to say, I did tell you about this. This was a scenario that you were made aware of. And I did have to go to that uh, that CYA uh, and go to that documentation and say, this was in the Enterprise Risk Register. It was made aware on this date. Absolutely. Uh, bad things could have happened had that documentation not, not been there. So for all those CISOs out there, please document, document, document. Uh, security, you're working in instant response. Make sure you document things that are out there. And you call that an Enterprise Risk Registry? Yes. I haven't. I've never actually never actually heard that before. That's interesting. Is that pretty common across like all businesses? Yeah, absolutely. If you've got a governance or risk management committee, uh, risk organization, you're going to have a risk register, and this risk register is not just security. Uh, you're going to have health and safety issues that are going to be in there, environmental, uh, ESG things. You know, any type of risk. Uh, you know. You, you can have your, your pest model, you know, political, environment, social, uh, uh, technological risks. All of those will be looked at by your, your risk committee. So, with so let me your, ask you from it. Oh, go ahead. With your fellow CISOs that you, you probably are networked in and tied in, and you, you keep in, in touch with a lot of them. Are they freaking out about chat GPT right now? Is it something they want to ban? Is it something they want to control? How, what's the general sentiment towards open AI right now? It is probably 50-50 of those that want to completely ban it and then those that want to control the, the way it is being utilized. And I think the, you know, the first half is it's a risk that we cannot control. And the second half is if we ban it completely, people are going to do it anyways. And because they're going to do it outside of our visibility, it's going to be so much worse. They're going to now forward everything to their home computer. They're going to download it all and they're going to start uploading it into their Gmail account. And now all of our corporate information is uploaded in a personal version uh, of Google Drive or you know, inside OneDrive or something like that as well. So, you know, again, there's a lot of people who are on each side like, I cannot believe you're, you're taking the stance. So it is a very hot topic right now. I imagine that there's one of your CISO friends probably looks like Mugatu from Zoolander. He's like, man, Chappie T is so hot right now. <laughs> so hot right you know, now. He's <laughs> stroking his bald cat and stuff. <laughs> and then there's some other guys who are like, heck no, you know, ban this. So ban what side of the fence are you on? If you if you were sitting on the uh, the customer side, would you be like, is this easier to block it? Or would you try to inspect and do data protection? <sighs> well, again... You know, my stance is that I'm not here to tell the business what to do. I am of the opinion of saying this is how you should be utilizing it. And, you know, as I said earlier, setting some of those guardrails out there of this is what's appropriate. This is how you should be utilizing it. I, I like positive voicing as well, uh, given the examples of this is how we recommend you do it or say thou shalt do this versus saying don't do this. It's kind of like that, uh, you know, person who's, you know, walking on the high wire, uh, you say, don't look down. Well, you t tell me, don't look down. The first thing I want to do is look down. <laughs> so rather than hey. to say, don't, don't look down. I say, Hey, look up, Eyes look at up. that bird yeah. up there. Same way you talk to children. So you say, okay, exactly. hey, you don't jump off that roof. Yeah. And then the first thing you do is <laughs> oh. like, okay, I'll jump off the roof. <laughs> so the CISO talks to everyone and the board included like their children. Got it. I think yes. I can do that job. I have four <laughs> kids. I am overqualified. <laughs> All right. For our second topic, professional pen testers and red teamers need not fear that they will be replaced by generative AI. 
a recent study commissioned by the security company Hawks Hunt. I've actually never heard of them. I thought it was a type of fox hunt, but there's actually a company called Hawks Hunt. Uh, well, they analyzed over 53,000 phishing emails and found out that email content generated by a human red teamer had about a 4.2% click rate. And that compares to just a 2.9% click rate for prompts created by ChatGPT. It's important to note that the study was done with GPT-3 and not the newer and better GPT-4 model that was just released a couple weeks ago. Funny enough, the country most likely to be tricked by a chat GPT prompt is the United States. This is evidence that people are still better than AI at creating phishing email lures, but I would still consider a 2.9% click-through rate pretty high, especially for someone with no professional training. So I know why chat GPT got his butt handed to him and it's because of my own house. And I know this because I'm married. I have three kids, or I'm sorry, four kids, three girls, right? And the one thing I know about women is that they are very, very wordy. They like to have conversations for hours on end. And I would say that a typical red teamer is this little propeller head that phishing email is like two or three sentences long, straight to the point, get them to click it. Whereas chat GPT is going to write a novel. Right. And people are like, Ugh, I'm not going to read this. And that's why the click rate is so low. Tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right. All right. So I I have heard of Hawks Hunt. So I'll start with that as uh, well. Nice. Okay. I never uh, heard of them. But yeah. So yeah, if you heard yeah, of them, you're um, more informed than me. Gamification. Uh, they, they like gamification as well. Uh, but I will say that the thing that Chat GPT, whether we're talking version three or four, doesn't really matter. It's missing one critical component, mm. and that's human intuition. And yeah, you know, I've heard it said so many times that humans are the weakest link when it yeah. comes to security. But I really believe that they're our best sensors. And if we think about this with the book Blink by Malcolm Gladwell, Malcolm Gladwell yeah. uh, the first two seconds of looking at something, we can make a pretty accurate judgment whether something is good or bad. So a human with intuition can take a look at it. To, to Brian's point as well, if it's too long, are we just going to delete it and be done with it? Or within two sentences, do I see something that's off? Do I click? What do I do with this? So I thought, I thought the rule of thumb was never judge a book by its cover. You're telling me that Humans you, just do that. You should. <laughs> you should. You should. Okay. But you're right, man. Users are like the, the weakest link. I always, I, I, during every single workshop, and I'm positioning like the, the zero trust messaging from Zscaler, I always talk about users on the network is yucky. I don't like it. And I said, you have to think about like your network historically. It's kind of like a high school, you know, a little party that's going on. Everyone's there to have a good time. But it's inevitable. There's a couple of kids there that have been huffing paint, right? A couple of real wild cards in the mix. And so if we can just take them out of there completely, they didn't even show up to the party. We're going to have a great time. Kick all those users off of it. You never have to worry about it. Yeah, it's true. I think there's, I, I've seen some, so, so not related to cybersecurity, but I think it was like the AI generated pictures of faces. And then I think people can tell because like if the eyes are like even like one millimeter off, like one's one millimeter above the other or something like that, like humans can tell right away that there's something not quite right with this, this person's face. But that's that, but, that's that discernment. We, we can't articulate what's wrong, but our, our mind is telling us something is wrong here. And that's why, you know, again, back to the book blank. I know something's wrong. I just can't tell you what it is. Report it delete it, do something with it. And until these AIs start having a little bit more knowledge or intuition or something like that, I think our jobs are going to be safe. Yeah, I think what generative AI, they do a good job. So they are large language models. So they do a good job of basic things like misspellings, poor grammar, some of the gigantic red flags for a phishing email, I think. Chad GPT and generative AI in general can take care of that. But creating a lure that's enticing enough for a user. And one example is last week we talked about the demise of Silicon Valley Bank. Like 
chat gpt doesn't even know that happened yet because it only goes up to like 2011 so it can't like take full advantage of current events to generate those lures but you know at the same time it can write a convincing email that says that you've lost access to your bank account click here to turn turn access back on but i mean take advantage of people as well and every time i wanted to really drive up my my click rate you know we could have it down to one percent and all of a sudden all i have to do is look at what quarter the bonuses are going to be paid and send a message saying it's from hr of here's everybody's annual bonus and send an excel file and you're going to get a 25 percent click rate people are curious they're going to click on that you know if it's promotion time uh, put something out there that says these are the promote people are being promoted to to director or VP, you're going to have a crap ton of people who are clicking. It's not legitimate. It doesn't, there are so many red flags I can put in there, but the, the content of it is so <laughs> interesting to the humans that they're going to click on it. I think the the biggest breach in Arizona that I'm aware of was financially motivated, or I guess the lore, right? An email went out. I think it was very it's like one sentence. Congratulations on your pay your pay raise. Click here to accept, and then had the C- CEO's signature. And people were like, "Finally, man! Heck click, yeah, right? <laughs> like, yeah, click that. got him." <laughs> yeah, the other one of mo- more recent history was Taylor Swift tickets because the whole debacle with Ticketmaster. Some of the the more clever red teamers use that and says, "Hey, I saw you try to get some Taylor Swift tickets. I know you, you didn't get them. Oh, here, here's a new batch of them. Click here to accept the to try your hand at a second batch of them." And that had a enormous click through rate. So yeah, just taking those current event lures, fight figuring out what people will enjoy and click on. And a lot of times, it's money. It comes down to money. Well, I, and that's I the know. thing. I mean, how many of these really come into your corporate email? <laughs> you know, your Amazon, your FedEx, your DHL packages come into your corporate thing. Uh, but we're all, you know, always clicking. I mean, I click it just because I believe in my security tools. They're going to just protect me at all times. But <laughs> open by the way, there's a, <laughs> yeah, there's at least one RSM at Zscaler that I met at boot camp that was so very excited about Taylor Swift. So I think she would have clicked that link. <laughs> Here's your, here's your chance to get, it's your second chance of getting tickets. Yeah. Like, I don't even like leaving the stage. She, she, she flew to another state to watch this person. Like, I, I don't get that. Very, very dedicated. But then again, like I would probably do Burning Man if I had more burning desires to do that. I don't know. You don't really want to live out in the desert in a trailer and hang out with people that are, I should say, I, I guess I'll say free spirited people. I just want to get the breaking bad van or RV and just, you know, a little play on it. I think, I, you know, find somebody that looks like Jesse and I'll, I'll be there Walter and just yeah. rock yeah. around in my underwear. Uh, get, oh, oh, get the Heisenberg you know, hat. A mental picture, man. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome, Ben. Something for you to sleep about. <laughs> so Brian, do you, or do you not own a Heisenberg hat? I do not own a Heisenberg hat, no. All right. Well, I, I know what you're getting for your birthday this year, then. If you knew where my birthday was. <laughs> for our third topic, this story was brought up last week when Brian said he refused to enroll in voice authentication with his bank, and for a good reason. Joseph Cox, a writer for Vice Motherboard, attempted to break into his own bank account using an AI-generated version of his voice. He phoned up the bank, played a clip saying he wanted to check his balance, played a clip that spoke his date of birth, and then generated an AI voice clip on the fly of a phrase the bank asked him to repeat. In this case, the phrase was, my voice is my password. After that, he had full access to the account information, including balances and a list of recent transactions and transfers without ever physically speaking any of those words. The bank Lloyds of UK touts their voice authentication to be as unique as someone's fingerprint and uses over a hundred different characteristics. TD Bank also offers a similar feature, and that is a hundred percent why I will never use voice as a sole authentication method. As you know, 
something you are, your voice biometric, is still a single factor. The bank asked for a date of birth, but given the plethora of data breaches out there, a date of birth is not considered a secure form of authentication anymore. So I'll be honest, I, I decided to go with this, but I stepped it up. I'm now doing the voice password thing. But what I did is I, I went out to voice.ai and I'm using a tool to disguise my voice. So number one, you got a call from my phone, which isn't that hard to spoof. But two, there's just a plethora of people. I can sound like Joe Biden or even my favorite Alex Jones, right? Whatever one I want to use, it's like another form of authentication and see if they can actually figure that out. What do you guys think? I think I want to hear your Alex Jones impression. <laughs> well, the thing is, you only have to say out like whatever it is, and like it just changes it dynamically. Hey, now, you know, the Bilderberg Group, they, they control the world's money. So you, you really got to take this seriously. They're trying to pull the wool over your eyes. I, I tell you, if we like, if there's one person I have in the podcast, it'd be Alex Jones, because that dude is wild. I think he's hilarious. He just, he just says the most wild stuff ever. It's not like I believe in all the conspiracy theories, but geez, he's a, he's a wild child. Oh, wait, we're talking about things. Go, go back. <laughs> Let's hear your Alex Jones impression. Oh, no, no. <laughs> uh, maybe once you stop recording, uh, I'll, I'll give you a treat there. But no, I, the, the amount of audio clips for people that have a public presence, the amount of times that each of us has been recorded, it, it's just a tremendous amount of data. The, the deep fakes that are out there now, and they are getting so much better that you can make it look like somebody said anything. So utilizing a, you know, a single form of authentication being your voice is a scary, scary thought. It, it, almost as bad as saying uh, you know, username and password. Uh, you've got to, got to bring in so many different forms of authentication, uh, you know, different tokens. Uh, yeah, I can't believe anything would have access to any type of data today without having multi-factor or, or two-factor enabled. It's something you have, something you know, something you are. You know, something you know being your username and password. Something you have being a hardware token. Uh, something you are being your biometrics, your voice, your iris scan or fingerprint. Uh, you know, you've got anything should be employing multiple factors at this point. Yeah, I wouldn't have as much of a problem with voice authentication if it wasn't just single factor. Like if I could speak my six number code off my Google Authenticator, like that would dramatically improve security on it because it's still something you have. And sure, you can AI generate my voice to say whatever you want, but you won't know what that six digit code is unless you have my token or my phone. Every bank in the world is like, this is a brilliant idea. We're going to steal it from Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do wonder though, like, let's say that you do that. You're like, you hear the balances and you're like, Hey, transfer money, transfer you to an agent right now. You're like, God oh, damn it. You're like, Oh, open up a new account, transfer you to another agent where you have to probably go through more things. Hey, validate your you know, address, date of birth, social, blah, blah, blah. I don't know how much you can get from the automated system that would make it really that bad. Sometimes you can't. It, it's, uh... You know, similar like a privilege escalation attack. It's it's no single attack gets you what you want. It's an attack chain. So I think knowing like the most recent transactions, like I, I I'm trying to remember the story of someone's how someone's GoDaddy got account got hijacked and they had to have like the access to the guy's email address. They had to have like the last four numbers of the credit card, and then in order to get the last four digits of the credit card, he had to call the bank and tell them what the last five transactions were or something. So it's maybe not draining your account just based on your voice but having that information out there is another step in this attack chain well not only that it's the the weakest link it's the the person at the other end of the line right like i remember i use this line all the time but i was at target and i walked up to an employee and i was like hey man do you mind if i open this and he's like he just looked me dead in the eyes like i wouldn't care if you murdered someone in front of me right <laughs> I don't get so paid I'm enough sure th for this. <laughs> exactly. I think there's a lot of people out there, especially people who answer the phones, are probably like, I'm having a bad day. So, you know, my break is coming up. What I got to do to get you off this phone? Yeah. this is, It's a numbers game. Yeah, I, and that's social engineering right there is you know, social. I don't have to have all the information. I just have to convince the person I am legitimate. 
just give me access to this. And, you know, the old, you know, before it was even called Red Team, you'd have these people who would call up cell phone companies with very little information. Here's my account number and a name. Don't have passwords, don't have pins, don't have anything. And they'd put like a baby in the background crying. Can you just help me out? You know, it's been a bad day. I've already had to call. I've lost my phone or I've lost my account, which is why I'm calling from, you know, a number that you don't know. And all they had to do was convince the person. Yeah, so, sim swapping. If, yeah. Like yeah. if you ever if you been call to me, DEF CON yeah. during Social Engineering Village, like there's some pretty impressive talent at that. Like, I, I highly recommend if you're ever at DEF CON, go to Social Engineering Village at one of their capture the flag events. It's it's very impressive what some of these people can do. So if you call me and there's a screaming baby in the background, I will do whatever you want to get off that phone. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, now we know how to social engineer Brian. Yeah. Very easy. Just uh, you know, like, hey, this nails is, on a chalkboard. This is Bob from IT. I'm going to need your password and your second factor code. I got a baby in the background. <laughs> Hand it over, I Brian. Mean, He's only had four kids. I mean, he can handle <laughs> crying. Not anymore. That's a lie. I was on a plane. There was a little kid crying. I was okay with it. but Because <laughs> you were crying right along with it. Got it. I will say, though, like, sometimes I'm out in public, and, like, a, a kid is just, like, an absolute terror. And I'm just, like, in my head, I'm like, I want to go spank the parents. Like, get your kid. <laughs> like, what the hell is wrong with you, man? So, so, I guess a side story. So, before I had kids I, I think i was still pretty sympathetic when there's a crying baby on the plane but you know after having kids there's you definitely see a dichotomy of passengers of the people that have had kids are like oh man i'm so sorry i've been there before and then the other half that have never had kids like why can't you get this baby to shut up <laughs> you encounter two personas on on airplanes with crying babies i think brian's kind of that weird one guy. he's like split in the middle yeah, he's had kids, but he doesn't on, like it. On my day. <laughs> d- 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 depends. Did he have lunch or is he hangry? That's yeah, true. You know, I do get a little hangry. Oh, there's also that third persona where they're just like, they they hate the kid, period, because like my tax dollars are going towards that. Your schools and your roads. and you know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. For our last topic, it, it will be a rotating topic every week. This week, we're going to talk about hard to cancel subscription services. And I'm, I'm 100% positive that this will resonate with every single person in our audience that they've had some subscription service that was nearly impossible to cancel. Yeah, your OnlyFans page. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta meet me in person on a Tuesday if you want to cancel that subscription, Brian. Yeah, foot long feet. Let's go. So the good news, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission is debating taking action against these so-called hard-to-cancel service services due to the enormous number of complaints that they get. That's really easy to sign up for a service online, but incredibly difficult to cancel, such as forcing users to call or even show up in person during business hours. The new rule they are proposing is called Click to Cancel and would require services that allow for signups online to give users the ability to cancel online. I'm usually on board for free market economics, but I can 100% get behind this kind of regulation. Services that are known for being notoriously hard to cancel include gym membership, the New York Times, and cable companies. I especially think this is needed now that just so many companies are turning things into subscriptions just like heated seats for your bmw will soon be a subscription and consumers should have an easy way to cancel and opt out so good job lena khan so this is the number one reason why if it comes to like any type of subscription i don't go directly to the vendor i just if i can buy it in apple it's exponentially easier to cancel if i don't want it heck even even in the the trials right you just sign up for it's like it's gonna be in 30 days well, guess what? If you just go in there and cancel it right away, you still get to use it for 30 days. This doesn't renew. So I'm a huge fan of that. But uh, LA Fitness used to be, when you talk about like, like gym stuff, when I was 18, I got a, a gym membership there and then I don't think I ever went, right? And so then I was like, oh, it's time to cancel. They're like, oh, you got to write a letter and then send it in. So I think I ended up having a gym membership for like two years. I used yeah. it once, right? Inevitably, and, they lose the letters. They tell you to send it yep. certified next time. And yeah, they just ding you for all those months that you're going back and forth yeah and then you know years later i end up going back to la fitness and 
I was with them for, I don't know, like maybe five or six years. And then there's a gym that was closer to me. So I'm like, oh, I'm just going to switch. And so I, I knew, right? I, I walked in with a letter. I'm like, all right, let's go. And I was like, yeah, I, I need to cancel my gym membership. And the lady's like, oh, okay. She's like, oh, we got to bill you out 30 days notice. It was the easiest thing I've ever done. It was like, I, I was blown away. I was ready for the whole, like, oh, we don't take it here. You got to mail it in, blah, blah, blah. Went in ready for the fight and they made it too easy. Yeah. No, no, I, you know, I think we've all ended up having to to call in saying, hey, I want to cancel this. Oh, sorry, I got to transfer you to this other department. And then you've got to sit on hold for 10, 15 minutes waiting for that uh, that renewals department or whatever. And then they're just trying to say, oh, well, why are, you, why are you canceling? And they're trying to social engineer you now. And they've got very convincing people. Well, you know, can I just switch you to this plan? No, I'm not using the gym. Well, you know, for only five dollars more, you can be on this plan. <laughs> you walk out paying more. <laughs> Absolutely, but you feel yeah. great about it, uh, you know, because they they just convince you to do it. But uh, again, it's just so hard to cancel some of these things because they they transfer you from department to part. Oh, yeah, I can't do that. Now I got to transfer you over to the credit card department, or now I got to transfer you over to this department. Uh, and then it's like, is it really worth? Is my time? You know, for a five dollar a month, uh, you know, subscription, is it not my time worth it to just keep paying it? So I really am a big fan. If I could just put it with my Apple subscription, if I could just pay it through through PayPal and you know, and just cancel it through there, uh, makes my life so much easier as well. Yeah, that's what Chris Young did. We had him on the show a couple like last last year, and he said, "Yeah, I just do everything through PayPal, not not just because of." You, you know, he has a single credit card. If it gets breached, I change it in one place. But also, you know, there that is the fact that if you pay through a third party payment processor like that, it's it's much easier to cancel. Because what what I hear from other people is, is it was easier to cancel my credit card than to deal with this company anymore. Dang, I I'm all for this, with the one exception, I don't want credit card companies to have a one click opt out of their credit card. I, I like the game because I always end up getting a bunch of points when I call it. Like I legitimately called like once a year to cancel the credit card just so they'd be like, well, if you spend $3,000 with us, we'll give you 150,000 points. I'm like, <laughs> you guys are dumb, uh, but dumb enough to keep me. Um, I don't think this, yeah, so the, the click to cancel rule, I think they specifically go into that. They said that it doesn't stop a company from presenting you know, alternative offers. Like, uh, I talked about Audible last month and I, I didn't want to pay for it because it was too much. And they, they, I canceled it. And then they said, Oh, but you know, if you stay with us, we'll give you 50% off for the next six months or so. So I'm like, all right, yeah, I'll, I'll take that. So it doesn't stop that, but it has to allow you to click on the same page. So with all those social engineering prompts and offers, they have to give you a direct link to cancel on there instead of just like, no, 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 15 times and then get to the cancel page. I like it. I like that. So do you guys, so Ben, I know you're, you're probably too new, right? But Chris, uh, let me ask you, I feel like I'm a little sympathetic to a sales campaign. Like if I'm trying to like cancel, uh, I don't know, like cable TV or cell phone and doing whatever, like I'll sit there and listen because I feel like, oh, you know, I sell stuff too. I should at least hear the spiel instead of being a jerk. Um, but I think the, the rule of the thumb here is that the uh, looking back, right? I feel like the sales guy always gets sold. Do you feel like you uh, get, get taken advantage as much as me? There's a, a really funny scene in Boiler Room where there's a guy. It's a, it's a, the, the story of Boiler Room, the guy becomes a stockbroker and, and he's pitching stock. Lift, lift all up day. your skirt and grab your balls, that one? You know? <laughs> I can so, go on and on. I know this movie by heart, but go on. So there's a, there's a scene when a, a guy tries calls up this stockbroker and tries to sell him a subscription to a newspaper. He gets his name wrong and everything. He's like, oh, okay, sorry to bother you. And then, and then the stockbroker's like, wait, that was your pitch? Like, if you call me, you should close me. Try to sell me. And then, and then he, he walks him through. He coaches him. He's like, well, why should I go with you? Why shouldn't I go with the voice or the times? And then the guy gives him all these benefits of going with his paper he's like and then the stockbroker thing is like hey good job you did a really good job pitching me and, and selling me and then the guy's other guy in the line is like well are you gonna buy a subscription and he goes the stockbroker goes no i already get the times click <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I'm, i i do like listening to salespeople to find out what their 
tactics are and if there's something that I can adapt to it so I think I can learn something from it I won't necessarily give them the ability to pitch just because they're in sales and I'm in sales but if it's somebody that can demonstrate value like something I can get from them or they go out of their way like uh, here, here's a hint if there's any LinkedIn recruiters out there listening like I get a million LinkedIn requests a day and recruiters always hit me up and if they mention the podcast or if they mention something very specific that shows up, they don't send off, you know, a thousand of these emails a day and that this was targeted, I'll actually respond. I might not, you know, want what they, they have, but I will respond if they talk about the podcast or something very specific to my profile that says this wasn't just blanketed mass mailed out. It's kind of the opposite. Anytime they refer to the podcast as instant delete, I don't know, I don't know what you're selling. <laughs> so yeah. too many of us. So, so I, I'm kind of you know mixed here. And if you're a salesperson and you call me, you know, cold call, you know, whatever. If you can show me that you did research, I will generally help you. I will listen. Uh, I will respond. Now, if you gave me the worst, the you know, it was just horrible. Now, now the the coach in me wants to help coach them a little bit along so they don't mess it up for the next one. Yeah, and I'll tell them, hey, dude, you already messed this up. Not going to close anything, not going any further, but let me help you. This is your job. This is how you put food on the table. Let me help you for the next person you call. And then I will give them some some feedback there. Ben and I was to. giving back. All around <laughs> no, good guy. Back to the people. All around, All around good, good guy. Good. All around good CISO. <laughs> I'm telling you. Yeah, I, I wish Glenn was on. He so Glenn for the listeners never joined us here, but uh, I know he he's spoken before. He's a member of Planet Fitness, and I've also heard Planet Fitness is notoriously hard to cancel. They they do the pitch ten bucks a month, no commitment, sign up easy online. But I, I guess the process to quit Planet Fitness is quite cumbersome. You have to show up in person and. Not not unlike stories. I, I remember reading a story. I don't know if it was LA Fitness or it was another one, but they said you have to show up in person. You have to meet the manager. It's only during business hours. And then this person that was trying to quit would show up and says, oh, he's out to lunch. Come back later. Like, oh, he took off early today. Come back later. Just made it literally impossible for this person to quit, even though they were trying to do everything right. So, I mean, I, I hope this thing goes through. I think this is much needed regulation. And I, I'm, like I said before, I'm 100% for it. I'm for it too, Chris. Does that make you feel better? Yeah. The, the other thing <laughs> that's interesting is for services that require a bank account and they do a direct debit from your bank account, which I think is extra scummy, I guess, because it's much easier to, cancel a credit card but if to cancel a bank account like you have your bill pay tied to it you have the direct mm -hmm. deposit tied to it there's just such a higher barrier to entry to switching your your bank account in for, for some things i get it like comcast i know will give you five dollars a month for auto pay on credit card they'll give you 10 bucks a month for auto pay through checking account i guess for the reason that it's much harder to close your checking account and i think the incidence of fraud is much less likely through a checking account. So if they give you some kind of incentive to do that and they give you the choice, I think is okay. It's your choice to accept the bigger discount for the bigger inconvenience. But to force you and say you'll, you can only pay through your bank account, I'm not on board with that. We should talk here in the future, like on OPSEC around bank accounts and stuff. Like I know we all know not to use our debit card, right? But you still probably have a debit card. Um, I know for me, like I, I have one specific account that has very limited funds in there. That way, if it was ever compromised for whatever reason, then, you know, oh, no, you took all $23. <laughs> no, no yeah. same thing, you know, when you travel, you know, I, I have a spare wallet when I travel that's got like one credit card. I keep, you know, a little bit of amount of cash in there. So if anybody, you know, asks for my wallet, you get mugged when you're traveling abroad. I have a wallet with something in it. You know, you give them an empty one, they're going to know something's up. Uh, yeah. It's just, you know, learning these little things. Decoy wallet. <laughs> so my, my wife is always so pissed because anytime we travel, I will always, I always bring like cash, right? I just throw cash, you know, in a, in a drawer just for a rainy day, right? So if I'm going to travel, I want to have tip money. It looks like a lot of money, but it's not, right? Like, especially if you're going to Mexico, but I'll have a wad of cash. And she's like, don't pull out the money. 
if someone's gonna mug you, I'm like, number one, like, who's gonna mug me? Like, I really, and then two, like, I kind of want to get mugged. I'm looking for a fight. So, what do you want from me right now? <laughs> He's always looking for a street fight. <laughs> yeah. He's looking forward to it until he isn't. It's like 16 teenagers surround you, and <laughs> it's like, all right. Well, I told you about the time I, <laughs> like, I almost got beat up by a bunch of, like, five year olds, right? In Mexico. <laughs> Yes, yes, I do remember that. Yeah. <laughs> I do remember that one. Come on, bring it. <laughs> bring it. See, old, the age-old adage, would you rather fight one fifth grader or five first graders? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, ben, long story short, basically just doing you know, a little bit of drinking south of the border. And then walked out in the alleyway and I had like a little uh, necklace on. It was like a Nike swoosh. And a little kid came up. I'm like, oh, this is kind of weird. And then, like, then all of a sudden, there's like twenty of them, right? And they're just like reaching for it, and they're chasing me around, trying to get my <laughs> my chain from me. So, yeah, I almost got mugged by a bunch of little kids. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, at that t- point, you only got to take down one, right? Set an example. Exactly. You know, punt them in the next week. <laughs> punt so. them. Listen. <laughs> oh. Uh, yeah. No reason to be a bully, man. You know. You know, going back to the the whole like, remember, were you saying intuition earlier? What were we, were we like talking at the very beginning of the story about people? Was it intuition or the? No, yeah, yeah, the red teamers. Uh, the red teamers. Uh, you know, Chat GPT is not going to take our jobs yet, and I'm like, uh, you know, right now people have intuition, which is why you know, our jobs should be safe right now. So I. I don't know if you heard a couple episodes ago, but I was talking about like the, the child trafficking stuff. And so like, now I feel like I'm hyper aware and I didn't know about intuition. I didn't know if I really believed it, but lately, like anytime we go out to like a public place, like I'm looking for these predators, right? It's like, yeah, you look like a scumbag. And then I'm probably wrong, but I don't know. I'm just, I'm out there always looking. I don't know how well my intuition actually works just yet. Say something, say something, Brian. See something, yeah. say something. But that's the I, thing is, uh, you know, with daughters, it's like you're going out, you know, with your friends. You're going out shopping. Just be aware of people who are following you when you're out, people who follow you into the parking lot, and whether they're male or female, you know, and start chatting you up, uh, following you to your car. You, you're having to make your children and, you know, your children's friends aware of, social cues and uh, aware these things still happen. Uh, these things happen in, in the U S things, these things happen in first world countries as well. So, you know, even though you're in a nice neighborhood, it could still happen. So just be aware. Yeah. Situational awareness, hundred percent. Well, we continue to get great comments about our dad joke of the week. Dad joke of the week. This week, our guest Ben is up. All right, so I know that we're on separate coasts, so I wanted to bring in a little ocean humor for us today. So my Let's dad go. joke is going to be, what is the most detail-oriented ocean? The, the Pacific Ocean. The Pacific. <laughs> yeah, you like that. Yeah. I got it, finally. <laughs> you got one. It's all the years of being a dad helped me out here. Ah. Wah, 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 wah. That's a good one, Ben. All right. To wrap things up, people are posting confidential information into chat GPT. Humans are still better at writing phishing emails for now. Don't use voice authentication for your bank. And subscriptions should be as easy to cancel as they are to sign up. That's all we have for this week. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode. You can find us all on LinkedIn. Links will be in the description. Follow us on Instagram at PevCAC Podcast. Thank you to all our listeners and subscribers who rate us five stars in the iTunes store and Spotify and left us a review. We appreciate you all spreading the word to help grow the show. The best way to find us is to search for the PevCAC Podcast on your favorite podcast listening app. My co-host Brian Deach and our guest Ben Coral. The walkers are coming, Coral! And just had to throw that in at some point. Walkers, Coral. <laughs> Coral. Walkers. Coral. I'm Chris Louie. Thanks for listening. We'll see you all next week. And as always, have a nice day. As as Glenn would say, bye, Felicia. Have a nice day.